And we're going to go ahead and just jump right in. I want to introduce Barry Brown. He is with the State Department um, of Economic Development, and he's going to get us started going over kind of an overview of what Heritage Tourism in and is and how it can help our community. Thanks, Barry. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, I'm Barry Brown and uh, work for the state of Georgia in heritage tourism. And uh, I used to, to work for the Georgia Civil War Commission, which is a, another state agency. And I uh, was really working on Civil War involved projects. When uh, I was hired as heritage tourism specialist, to just be able to suss out and find and survey historic sites throughout the state, and especially ones that had the potential to draw tourists. I'm going to tell you sort of the basics of what heritage tourism is and what's involved in it. First, I'm going to start with what the Georgia Tourism Division does. And the Georgia Tourism Division um, this sort of gives an overview that the Georgia Department of Economic Development Tourism Division assists individuals, visitors, and groups to discover Georgia's unique vacation options and make it easy for them to plan a, a very, hopefully, satisfying leisure stay. Uh, we also s assist the state's communities and attractions in drawing potential travelers to their, their communities and their attractions. Here's just a publications and programs uh, listing of what we do uh, to promote Georgia tourism. And as you see down on the bottom, I'm not going to read through all of these, but down on the bottom we have the, the sesquicentennial site and the gacivilwar.org, which I am so heavily involved. Uh, but we also have an African-American uh, guide. We have uh, the Georgia Travel Guide that comes out every year. And we have explorageorgia.org, which is a site that if you have a site you want people to come to, you absolutely have to be linked to our explorageorgia.org. If it's Civil War related, it will then be also linked to the GeorgiaCivilWar.org site. And here is a map of, the, of Georgia with the nine tourism regions broken out. Now, for marketing purposes, we divided the state into nine travel regions. These regions were drawn around traffic corridors and areas uh, marketed by convention and visitor bureaus and uh, regional travel associations. Uh, they offer a starting point for both the visitor and regional partners in defining the different areas of Georgia. And uh, I believe Douglas County is in the Atlanta Metro travel region. Which gets us down to the meat of why I'm here. What is heritage tourism? And um, the definition I came up with was, it's a personal encounter with traditions, history, and culture. Each community has a story to tell, and this is all about your stories, your authentic stories. And as I say, it must be authentic, they must be true, they must be well-researched. And that's what people want, they want your stories. Now here's an example of what we consider heritage tourism sites, and I'm going to throw some Douglas County names in here as I, as I go through them. Well, battlefields and military are war-related sites, and of course you all have Sweetwater Creek, you may have more. Cemeteries, well, the Founder Cemetery, the Van Zant Cemetery over at Le Jardin Blanc, or um, the Basket Creek Cemetery. Is anybody familiar with that one? Is that Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's on the National Register. I'd, I'd certainly like to yeah. see it. Um, courthouses. You have this, this wonderful 1956 courthouse. Most courthouses in Georgia are from a much earlier style, a much earlier time, or much later. But your 1956 courthouse is almost unique, and uh, I love the neon touch there and the, and the museum in it. Wonderful courthouse. Historic downtowns and neighborhoods. Museums. Native American sites, and by the way, Sweetwater Creek is just as much of a Native American site as it is a Civil War site. Plantations and, and grand historic homes, such as Le Jardin Blanc. Native American, oh, I've already said that, excuse me. And uh, railroad depots. 
And I also wanted to mention the Clinton Nature Preserve and, and uh, the dog trot log home there. Now, what is the person, or what a type of person are you marketing to to come visit these, these heritage sites? And, and what are their characteristics? Well, heritage tourists tend to be well-educated. The education level is a significant factor that influences cultural and heritage travel. They tend to be older. People between the ages of 45 and 65, they're, they're in their peak earning years. Here's one I like. It's influenced by women. Any of you men in here that has a wife or a mother, you know that that's absolutely true. <laughs> women, women decide how discretionary income is spent, especially when it, when it involves vacations. Uh, they are, here's the important one, they are generous in spending $62 more per day than the non-heritage involved traveler. They're more inclined to stay overnight. They'll eat in your restaurants. They'll stay in your hotels. They'll enjoy your bed and breakfasts. And the very important, they insist on authenticity. So I'm just going to have a little overview here. As I say, I haven't done a survey on the county, but you do have some wonderful sites. I may be missing some. <laughs> but Sweetwater Creek is uh, about 2,500 acres, am I right? Something like that. With a 215 acre uh, Sparks Reservoir. At the time that the new Manchester Mill was built in the 1840s, it was one of the tallest buildings in the state of Georgia. It uh, certainly is, is styled after the, uh, the New England cotton mills at the time, and uh, with the red brick and uh, just the way the building's styled and the way the windows are, are, are built to let in the most light to uh, avoid having a, a fire. Um, it's got the beautiful stonework around the mill race. And I don't know what the visitation is per year, but it's just a phenomenal park. Um, of course, during the war, you have uh, elements of Stoneman's division, which were the Federals, came and, and, and took the women who were working there prisoner, charged them with, with treason, and um, they sent them north as prisoners. They sent them along with the women of Roswell. There's a famous story of the women in Roswell. People always tend to forget that Sweetwater Creek, the women were also arrested. They were also put on trains in Marietta. They were also sent north uh, of the Ohio River. And um, the, the difference, of course, between Sweetwater and Roswell is that Roswell would once again come back to life as a, as a mill town. And uh, Sweetwater Creek would, uh, would essentially cease to exist as a, as a living town. And here is a, a view of the, the beautiful factory shoals um, along uh, Sweetwater Creek. And uh, this is where you have the Native American history. This is where, well, beauty, nature, and history all combine here. Um, in the summers, I always like to take my son here, and he uh, goes swimming in the, in the rocks. I'll watch him. He's only six, but uh, he loves Sweetwater Creek. Now this, this home, the Jardin Blanc, very beautiful. I would consider it as the cradle of Douglasville. And um, it's on its 11 acres, uh, you get an idea of the, the original Douglasville, the original intent uh, of its makers. You have the Founders Cemetery with the Van Zant family buried there. You, you have the gardens, you have the, the smokehouse out back. Uh, it's used as an event facility. It's really a, a fantastic asset for the city of Douglasville. It is quite possibly one of the oldest, if not uh, the oldest homes in, in Douglasville. Here is uh, an example of the grounds in the back, which uh, I thought were also very beautiful with, with the fountain. And uh, it was, looks like it was set up for a wedding or an event here. Keeping up with my slides. And um,
and the marker put up by the Douglasville Historic Preservation Commission in 2005 for the Van Zandt Cemetery. So uh, it's, you have the founders right there, um, a few miles down on uh, the main street from, from the town in which they found it. And here is a, uh, the building that I've already mentioned, your 1956 courthouse. It's, it's a, a beautiful courthouse. What, what are the museum hours of operation? Does anybody know? Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays and Thursdays. From 1 to 5. So it's all volunteer? Okay. Well, I, I really need to stop and see that. Um, I'm going to be bringing my son out to Villa Rica soon, and I, I think I will stop on the way here and, on a Tuesday or Thursday and see that. Your modern courthouse, too, by the way, is very beautiful. Now, tourism is, and the point I'm trying to make, it is economic development. It is great for downtowns. It brings in people who whose interests uh, and, and who are interested in, in heritage and who have money to spend, and that's what's important. The benefits of tourism to your area's economic development now. It generates additional tax revenue, helping to fund community services and the infrastructure. It creates jobs and worker incomes. It diversifies the economy. It generates support businesses. It uh, brings in um, new money, creating growth, an infusion of cash. It promotes new development. Today's visitor might possibly be tomorrow's investor. And it just improves the overall aesthetic of the community. Here are some of the travel industry beneficiaries, and I'm not going to read through that, but transportation accommodations, food service, attractions and events, and, and retail sales. And I do have copies of these studies if anybody would like one. The tourism industry's impact in Georgia See this here, 241,000 tourism-related jobs, 6.3 billion in resident wages. Travelers spent over 34.8 billion in total economic impact, 1.5 billion in state and local revenues, 850 million in tax revenue, and 574 million in local tax revenue. And this is from a 5,009, excuse me, a 2009 study. So tourism, is economic development. It's not a cure-all, but it's an important piece of the economic development puzzle. And we have tourism reps for each of the nine regions, and you can find who your rep is, who happens to be Brittany Gray, at www.marketgeorgia.org. And my email address, there at the bottom, bbrown at georgia.org. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we want to use... Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And one of the reasons that we wanted to have this meeting and have Bear here is because we do already have tourism in the area that comes from groups coming in, especially Six Flags. Um, but heritage tourism just seemed like a market that we weren't specifically targeting, that we were missing out on. So we thought, you know, what better than to have a meeting and you leverage all our assets, see exactly what we had, and then go from there. So. Um, the next speaker we have is Tom Duke. He is from Populous, and they do, and he can tell you a little bit more of everything that they do, but um, he's going to go over, he's worked with some different cities and communities on doing um, a digital application for some of the heritage, um, heritage tourism or historic sites. Um, so if you want to go ahead and get started, you can tell more about it. All right, thank you, Randy. I'd like to thank Randy for inviting me here today. I'm Tom Duke, and uh, my company, Populous, is developing a mobile app for the Douglasville CVB. It's going to be a basically a digital version of the uh, Visitor's Guide, the new one that's coming out. Um, 
It'll be a native mobile app available in the Apple App Store for uh, iPhones, iPads, and Android. Um, we're headquartered in Carrollton. I grew, I graduated from Villarica High School. I've grown up in the Douglas County, Carroll County area. Uh, and heritage tourism is really the reason that I got into this business. My partner was an app developer, and I went on a couple of calls with him and kind of got going and being able to go to places and find out the history, go into the neat buildings. Every, that every town's unique as you travel around Georgia. You've got the railroad towns, the old city squares, and uh, just seeing what people are doing in their areas to promote heritage tourism, whether it's cemeteries or tours of home. Uh, I really enjoy getting into there and uh, doing the, uh, the research for those. Anything you would consider for a brochure going forward, you really should consider some sort of digital accompaniment. And really, in the next couple of years, the brochure is going to be accompanying the digital version, whether it's an app or a mobile website. Uh, you guys have this Founding Fathers walking tour. It's a perfect, it's a great brochure, lots of information in there. It's perfect for a walking or driving tour. Uh, we've created some, and I can pass the iPad around, but <clears throat> this is one we did for St. Simons. We were down there for a meeting. And I'll just give you an example. Welcome to St. Simons Island. So you can put all this in St. there. St. Simons Island is the largest island of Georgia's world-renowned Golden Isle. Get the idea, but you go around. This is a 10 stop tour, driving and walking tour of St. Simons. Cool. It's GPS based. It's <laughs> really cool. It takes you around uh, with brochures. If you've ever worked trying to create a brochure, you're limited by space. The larger the brochure is, the more information you put in there, the more expensive it gets. So, this is a way you're not limited per se like you are on a brochure. There are limitations, and really, the limitations are what a person's uh, attention span is. You can't go on and on about something for 10 minutes. You'll just lose the, the person's interest. So kind of devised it. You've got a minute, two minutes, which that's a lot of text. You know, if you take a page, you can read a page of text in about a minute. So if you think about that, all the things that you fit in your brochures, you can expand on it. All that information that wouldn't fit, you can add to it. You can add pictures. You can add rich media. All of these have a pictures accompanied. You put maps for historical places putting people like to see what was what it looked like back when so if you've got a historic building and you show a picture of what it looked like in 1895 and then what it looks like today and the things different things it's been used for that's what people really grab onto those little nuggets of information that they can take back that they feel like they know and other people don't know and that's something that we're always looking for. Uh, right now I'm working on uh, with Rome, Georgia on their Myrtle Hill Cemetery. We're doing a walking tour out there. Uh, they really promote their cemeteries. 1857 was the first interment. It's got a Civil War section. They do a lot of tours out there. They've got a resident historian, Ms. Ann Culpepper. She's wonderful, but I've spent 40 hours with them walking and developing the stories to give it uh, a narrative to carry you through the, the cemetery. Um, we're going to be working with Richmond Hill. They're doing a driving tour of their historical markers in town, which they're kind of half Henry Ford and half Civil War, and they're bringing that all together. And instead of coming out with another brochure, they're going straight to doing a, a mobile app. It's a great way to reach millions of people for very little money relative to what it costs to get brochures or to take out ads. You could get a driving tour similar to this for less than you could take out a half page ad in Atlanta Magazine. And this is 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Uh, you can update it, you can make changes. It's not static, it doesn't just sit there. It's a living and breathing. And with 200 and, I think we're up to 200 million people with just Apple customers, you know, you can't reach that many people with print. You can't reach that many people really with television because of all the networks and regional. This is something that gets put out there and people are starting to look for apps before they go to the, the internet. Um, the latest numbers from <clears throat> two months ago, it's only a tenth of a percent, but more people are downloading apps and surfing the web on their mobile devices, which, you know, that something to consider when you're comparing doing a mobile um, 
website or getting an app. A mobile website is really a courtesy. Just in case somebody goes to your website from their mobile device, they should be able to read it. Uh, but an app is a tool for the person to use while they're in your area or to bring them to your uh, facility. And it's marketing. Like I said, the, the cost of it and having it in the app store where people can find it. You guys are building a new conference center. The things that bring Douglasville up, people can, you know, if they're considering Douglasville, you can send them to the app store and they can download the Douglasville CVB app. They can download the historic walking tour, anything else you have. And it just builds up that promotion of the, of the city and the county. Our latest app, if you do have a uh, Apple device, uh, Lake Lanier CVB app just came out last week. It's doing very well. It's featured under the new uh, apps in the app store under travel. It's easy to use, looks good. It's got web links for booking on the hotels. Uh, one of the innovative things we've done that nobody had done before on, le on lake areas is we have actual lake info where you can go to with dam release times, water levels, lake events, and things of that nature marina listings so you can find it from the lake. Um, it's GPS backed. It uses uh, the Google Maps. So the important thing, one thing a paper map doesn't do is it doesn't show you where you are. You know, you can take the map out there and it's, you know, they're great, but if I'm not from the area, you know, I don't know where I'm at on a map. So when you're visiting an area, knowing where you are, getting your little blip, on your GPS to show you where you are in relationship to everything else. It's uh, very important to the user. Uh, one thing that we, I go around meeting with people and talking to uh, different museums. Uh, we met with Heritage Sandy Springs last week. I believe we're gonna be working with them doing one for their museum and Civil War driving tour. Is worried about getting the next generation interested in historical preservation. You know, if nothing else, if that app gets the next 20 people interested in historical preservation, and those are the people sitting in this meeting 20, 30 years from now, it's worth every penny of it. You've got to connect uh, with that younger generation to keep preserving our history. I met with Crawford Long uh, Museum, and 20 years ago, they were getting a lot of students from University of Georgia coming up and things, and that's just tapered off, and they're looking for a way to build up that interest again in their little museum they have. It's a great museum, but nobody knows it's there. And this is just a great marketing tool. It's a great way to put out press releases and to build interest, kind of regain interest in whatever you're trying to promote. Does anyone have any questions about uh, mobile apps, smartphones? How creative can you get? Um, I had an app I, I was looking for, it, but I think I've deleted it, where you could go and hold your phone up to the city streetscape and, and then it would show you what it looked like in the past or it would show you a future version of it? I mean, can you that's guys get that kind of creative? That's using augmented reality, okay. which we're not using right now because it's so finicky. Okay. It's not a, right. it's a great idea and it looks good when people show presentations on it, but it's, it's just not quite there yet. So we haven't implemented it. What we have done is you can put pictures and you can kind of do a fade into the new one. We'll, we kind of, okay fake augmented reality just because augmented reality things change and it's based on what things are looking like now so if somebody moved an awning or whatever you're keying in on if that changed it would it would mess so it up. we could do something kind of like that with the walking tool oh, so that you could kind of see well this is what it was before this is what it is now and kind of a you yeah. know you fade in pictures way. if you get good pictures that are fair, more or less from the same angle okay which is easy to do you just take an old picture and try to set up and take a new picture <laughs> like it and just you could fade them in and out uh, showing maps like the layout of the city. I was watching uh, something on History Channel today. I think it was Dolly Madison or something. But they showed a map of Washington, D.C. in 1804. And everything we think about now is like cities and all the sprawl that leads up to it. You rarely just drive up on a city. Well, Washington, D.C. was just, it was there and there was nothing around it. There were some roads coming in from Philadelphia and from the south. But seeing that, those kind of things, really makes it click in people's head what it was like in the old days. They figure, oh, well, there's some old buildings here. Everything else must have been here also. And just seeing what wasn't here yeah. is sometimes as interesting as seeing what was here. Is, is there, um, and this may be totally crazy, is there a Georgia app where if someone's driving, then there would, like say, they're just, they're driving, that's for the state of Georgia, 
They're coming near Douglasville. There's a, a link they can click on, and then whatever we put out there immediately can come in. So is that even possible? There's not something. Well, it is apps and all the research and the way people are using their devices, because now we can, you can't really track what people are doing with print other than they're getting it, and you can you see them use it, but they're able to tell, you know, people's habits. And instead of these big monolithic, all-inclusive things, people are using these little individuals. So for Douglasville, the marketing aspect, having Douglasville's name on the app, your logo and that kind, and your contact information. That's what. But people are looking for those apps when they go somewhere. If I'm coming, if I was coming to a conference or a wedding here at the committee, which I've been to them here, people look for the apps if they're staying at a for a hotel. If you're out of town, staying at the hotel. I travel in business a lot. The first thing I want to do is find a place to eat. Uh, when I check, and usually it's open the window and look around, but usually you just see the fast food when these apps, you can list your downtown areas, your local flavors and things like that. Yes, what's the cost? Of, what are you talking for a cost? Like if Douglasville wants to do this app, what's the cost? They started about $3,000 and that's for three devices, um, which is less, like I said, than a half page ad in Atlanta magazine. Mm -hmm which a lot of people advertise in. It goes up from there depending on how involved and how much work we have to do. Something like this Founding Fathers, something like this where obviously somebody's already done all the research and got all the writing, that's where it starts at 3,000. If we have to be involved, like Rome, where I've spent 40 hours writing content, the price goes up, but it's still, it doesn't double or anything like that. And, and to update, like I, well, when you were saying Lake Lanier, you have the dam release times and so on, which I assume probably change well, the dam, during the year. What we've done is we've created a hybrid, and it pulls that information from the, from the different websites to keep it updated. Things like that are safety issues that will, you know, for dam release schedule. So we're pulling that right from the Corps of Engineers website. Uh, but updates, we have a subscription fee, and it keeps it live. We maintain it in the website. Um, like Randy's just going to have her calendar of events tied to it and that'll stay live and we'll make any updates within a reasonable amount of time. We would say 24 hours, but the Apple Store, you have to submit an update and wait a week, 10 days for it to get there. But there are sections of it that you can have pulling right from a website for immediate, um, immediate action. You can also connect your uh, Facebook, your Twitter feed. We're working on one right now for... Uh, Sandy Springs, which will be debuting in a couple of weeks. We previewed it at their open house last week. But uh, theirs is more of an informational. They're going to use it as a spotlight, Sandy Springs. They're going to use it as a sales tool where they can go to conferences to bring conferences here or wedding shows and things like that. They can take this with them. It features their Anne Frank exhibit. Their map part, it has connect on it where you can, it's a messaging center that's tied to their Twitter account. So if you're wanting to real time message people, if you had one for Main Street and you're having events down here, Taste of those and things like that, you can send out tweets and it goes straight to the people's app that they have it. I equated if you've got a product that you're trying to sell and Walmart agrees to put it on their shelf, you don't really have to market it anymore because people are going so many people are going to see it. So putting it in the app store and getting it searched and found like that. You still want to tell people about the app. You can put QR codes and stuff in your brochures and stickers. Lake Lanier had 100 downloads the first day, and that was just from Facebook postings, basically, and word of mouth. So they didn't give away probably 100 brochures that day. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? I've got brochures and cards if anybody's interested talk further afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.